verses 26 to 33. After many terrible threatenings of deserved wrath and vengeance, we have here surprising intimations of mercy, undeserved mercy, which rejoices against judgment, and by which it appears that God has no pleasure in the death of sinners, but would rather they should turn and live. In jealousy for his own honor, he will not make a full end of them, v 2628. It cannot be denied but that they deserve to be utterly ruined, and that their remembrance should be made to cease from among men, so that the name of an Israelite should never be known but in history, for they were a nation void of counsel, v. 28, the most sottish inconsiderate people that ever were, that would not believe the glory of God, though they saw it, nor understand his loving kindness, though they tasted it and lived upon it. Of those who could cast off such a God, such a law, such a covenant, for vain and dunghill deities, it might truly be said, there is no understanding in them. It would have been an easy thing with God to ruin them and blot out the remembrance of them, when the greatest part of them were cut off by the sword, it was but scattering the remnant into some remote obscure corners of the earth, where they should never have been heard of any more, and the thing had been done. CEs 512 God can destroy those that are most strongly fortified, disperse those that are most closely united, and bury those names in perpetual oblivion that have been most celebrated. Justice demanded it, I said I would scatter them. It is fit those should be cut off from the earth that have cut themselves off from their God, why should they not be dealt with according to their deserts? Wisdom considered the pride and insolence of the enemy, which would take occasion from the ruin of a people that had been so dear to God, and for whom he had done such great things, to reflect upon God and to imagine that because they had got the better of Israel they had carried the day against the God of Israel, the adversaries will say, our hand is high, high indeed, when it has been too high for those whom God himself fought for, nor will they consider that the Lord has done all this, but will dream that they have done it in despite of him, as if the God of Israel were as weak and impotent, and as easily run down, as the pretended deities of other nations. In consideration of this, mercy prevails for the sparing of a remnant and the saving of that unworthy people from utter ruin, I feared the wrath of the enemy. It is an expression after the manner of men, it is certain that God fears no man's wrath, but he acted in this matter as if he had feared it. Those few good people in Israel that had a concern for the honor of God's name feared the wrath of the enemy in this instance more than in any other, as Joshua, Jos 7 9, and David often, and, because they feared it, God himself is said to fear it. He needed not Moses to plead it with him, but reminded himself of it what will the Egyptians say? Let all those whose hearts tremble for the ark of God and his Israel comfort themselves with this, that God will work for his own name, and will not suffer it to be profaned and polluted, how much soever we deserve to be disgraced, God will never disgrace the throne of his glory. In concern for their welfare, he earnestly desires their conversion, and, in order to that, their serious consideration of their latter end, v 29. Observe. Though God had pronounced them a foolish people and of no understanding, yet he wishes they were wise, as do. 529, oh that there were such a heart in them. And PS 94 colon 8, you fools, when will you be wise? God delights not to see sinners ruin themselves, but desires they will help themselves, and, if they will, he is ready to help them. It is a great piece of wisdom and will contribute much to the return of sinners to God, seriously to consider the latter end, or the future state. It is here meant particularly of that which God by Moses had foretold concerning this people in the latter days, but it may be applied more generally. We ought to understand and consider the latter end of life, and the future state of the soul. To think of death as our removal from a world of sense to a world of spirits, the final period of our state of trial and probation, and our entrance upon an unchangeable state of recompense and retribution. The latter end of sin, and the future state of those that live and die in it. Oh that men would consider the happiness they will lose, and the misery they will certainly plunge themselves into, if they go on still in their trespasses, what will be in the end thereof, Je 531. Jerusalem forgot this, and therefore came down wonderfully, Lamb 1 9. He calls to mind the great things he had done for them formerly, 
as a reason why he should not quite cast them off. This seems to be the meaning of that, v 30, 31, how should one Israelite have been too hard for a thousand Canaanites, as they have been many a time, but that God, who is greater than all gods, fought for them. And so it corresponds with that. When he was turned to be their enemy, as here, and fought against them for their sins, then he remembered the days of old, saying, Where is he that brought them out of the sea? So here, his arm begins to awake as in the days of old against the wrath of the enemy. There was a time when the enemies of Israel were sold by their own rock, that is, their own idol gods, who could not help them, but betrayed them, because Jehovah, the God of Israel, had shut them up as sheep for the slaughter. For the enemies themselves must own that their gods were a very unequal match for the God of Israel. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom, v 32, 33. This must be meant of the enemies of Israel, who fell so easily before the sword of Israel because they were ripe for ruin, and the measure of their iniquity was full. Yet these verses may be understood of the strange prevalency of the enemies of Israel against them, when God made use of them as the rod of his anger. How should one Canaanite chase a thousand Israelites, as it is threatened against those that trust to Egypt for help, ISA 30 17, 1000 shall flee at the rebuke of one, unless Israel's rock had deserted them and given them up. For otherwise, however they may impute their power to their gods, Hab 111, as the Philistines imputed their victory to Dagon, it is certain the enemy's rock could not have prevailed against the rock of Israel, God would soon have subdued their enemies, PS 81 14, but that the wickedness of Israel delivered them into their hands. For their vine, that is, Israel's, is of the vine of Sodom, v 32, 33. They were planted a choice vine, wholly a right seed, but by sin had become the degenerate plant of a strange vine, J 2 21, and not only transcribed the iniquity of Sodom, but outdid it. God called them his vineyard, his pleasant plant, ISA 5 7. But their fruits were, very offensive, and displeasing to God, bitter as gall. Very malignant, and pernicious one to another, like the cruel venom of asps. Some understand this of their punishment, their sin would be bitterness in the latter end, 2 SA 226, it would bite like a serpent and sting like an adder. He resolves upon the destruction of those at last that had been their persecutors and oppressors. When the cup of trembling goes round, the king of Babel shall pledge it at last, the day is coming when the judgment that began at the house of God shall end with the sinner and ungodly, God will in due time bring down the church's enemies.